Najuri Manor by Gerald Durrell. Dear Mr. Durrell, I am 18 years old, strong in wind and limb, having read your books. Can I have a job in your zoo? It is one thing to visit a zoo as an ordinary member of the public, but quite another to own one and live in the middle of it. This at times can be a mixed blessing. It certainly enables you to rush out at any hour of the day or night to observe your charges. But it also means that you are on duty 24 hours a day and you find that a cozy little dinner party disintegrates because some animal has broken its leg or because the heaters in the reptile house have failed or for any of a dozen reasons. Winter, of course, is your slack period and sometimes days on end pass without a single visitor in the grounds and you begin to feel that the zoo is really your own private one. The pleasantness of this sensation is more than slightly marred by the alarm with which you view the mounting of your bills and compare them to the lack of gate money. But in the season the days are so full and the visitors so numerous that you hardly seem to notice the passing of time and you forget your overdraft. The average zoo day begins just before dawn. The sky will be almost imperceptibly tinged with yellow when you are awakened by the bird song. At first, still half asleep, you wonder whether you are in Jersey or back in the tropics. For you can hear a robin chanting up the sun and accompanying it. The rich, fruity, slightly hoarse cries of the toricos. Then a blackbird flutes joyfully. And as the last of his song dies, the white-headed jay thrush bursts into an excited, liquid babble. As the sky lightens, this confused and cosmopolitan orchestra gathers momentum. A thrush vies with the loud, imperious shouts of the Sirimas, and the witches' cackle from the covey of magpies contrasts with the honkings of geese and the delicate, plaintive notes of the diamond doves. Even if you survive this musical onslaught and can drift into a doze again, you are suddenly and rudely awakened by something that resembles the strange, deep, vibrating noise that a telegraph pole makes in a high wind. This acts upon you with the same disruptive effect of an alarm clock, for it is the warning that Trumpy has appeared. And if you have been foolish enough to leave your window wide open, you have to take immediate defensive action. Trumpy is a grey-winged trumpeter, known to his more intimate ornithologist friends as Sophia Crepitans. His function in the zoo is threefold. Combined guide, settler in, and village idiot. He looks, to be frank, like a badly made chicken, clad in somber plumage as depressing as Victorian morning. Dark feathers over most of his body and what appears to be a short silk cravat at his throat. The whole ensemble is enlivened by a pair of ash grey wings. He has dark, liquid eyes and a high, domed forehead arguing a brain power which he does not possess. Trumpy, for some reason best known to himself, is firmly convinced that his first duty of each day should be to fly into one's bedroom and acquaint one with what has been going on in the zoo during the night. His motives are not entirely altruistic, for he hopes to have his head scratched. If you are too deeply asleep or too lazy to leap out of bed at his greeting cry, he hops from the windowsill onto the dressing table, decorates it extravagantly, wags his tail vigorously in approval of his action and then hops onto the bed and proceeds to walk up and down, thrumming like a distraught cello until he is assured that he has your full attention. Before he can produce any more interesting designs on the furniture or carpet, you are forced to crawl out of bed, stalk and catch him. A task fraught with difficulty since he's so agile and you are so somnambulistic. 
push him out onto the window ledge and close the window so that he cannot force his way in again. Trumpy now having awakened you, you wonder sleepily whether it is worth going back to bed or whether you should get up. Then from beneath the window comes a series of five or six shrill cries for help. Looking out into the courtyard, on the velvet green lawns by the lavender hedge, you can see an earnest group of peahens searching the dewy grass, while around them their husband pirouettes. His burnished tail raised like a fantastic, quivering fountain in the sunlight. Presently, he will lower his tail, throw back his head, and deafen the morning with his nerve-shattering cries. At eight o'clock, the staff arrive, and you hear them shout greetings to each other amid the clank of buckets and the swish of brushes which all but drown the bird song. You slip on your clothes and go out into the cool, fresh morning to see if all is right with the zoo. In the long two-storied granite house, once a large cider press, and now converted for monkeys and other mammals, everything is bustle and activity. The gorillas have just been let out of their cage while it is being cleaned, and they gallop about the floor with the exuberance of children just out of school, endeavoring to pull down the notices, wrench the electric heaters from their sockets, or break the fluorescent lights. Stefan, broom in hand, stands guard over the apes, watching with a stern eye, to prevent them from doing more damage than is absolutely necessary. Inside the gorilla's cage, Mike, rotten and perpetually smiling, and Jeremy, with his Duke of Wellington nose and his barley sugar-colored hair, are busy sweeping up the mess that the gorilla's tenancy of the previous day entailed and scattering fresh white sawdust in snow drifts over the floor. Everything, they assure you, is all right. Nothing has developed any malignant symptoms during the night. All the animals, excited and eager at the start of a new day, bustle about their cages and shout, Good morning to you. Eatum, the black Celebes ape, looking like a satanic imp, clings to the wire, baring his teeth at you in greeting and making shrill, chuckling noises. The woolly-coated, orange-eyed mongoose, lemurs bound from branch to branch, wagging their long, thick tails like dogs and calling to each other in a series of loud and astonishingly pig-like grunts. Further down, sitting on his hind legs, his prehensile tail wrapped round a branch and surveying his quarters with the air of someone who has just received the freedom of the city is Binti, the Binturong, who suggests a badly made hearthrug to one end of which has been attached a curiously oriental-like head with long ear tufts and circular, protuberant and somewhat vacant eyes. The next door cage appears to be empty. But if you run your finger along the wire, a troop of diminutive marmosets come tumbling out of their box of straw, twittering and trilling like canaries. The largest of these is Whiskers, the Emperor Tamarin, whose sweeping snow-white Colonel Blimp moustache quivers majestically as he gives you greeting by opening wide his mouth and vibrating his tongue rapidly up and down. 